Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth, or Jörg, as you maybe know me too. This is the next reading of uh, the book from Edmond Paris, The Secret History of the Jesuits, which of course you know because of the intro that was just playing. And um, it's been quite a while since I have been reading this book. And um, partly of course it's my fault, and other parts it is not my fault, because I just was so busy doing other things um, that I didn't have the time to continue the book reading. But now we have today the 15th of January 2018. So you see how long this is ago when you look at the last part. Uh, within the next few days I will really try to get through the book um, because we only have some 80 pages or something left. As you can see we are on page 115 from 197 and we are starting to read today with the First World War. Now, a little explanation about the videos. Uh, in the meantime I have gotten a new uh, computer because some people supported me financially that I could get a new computer who will uh, easier uh, make, make the processing work easier because he has more cores and a uh, bigger processor and bigger CPU and all that stuff. Still not perfect, uh, you know, you can't ask people to pay you thousands of euros, but they supported me wonderfully, and hereby my thanks, even though they were German-speaking um, brothers. I don't know if they listened or watched to this video. I hope so they do. And um, I got a new camera, a new desktop camera, which uh, I don't use for this video. Um, it is OBS, probably a lot of people uh, know that. Uh, OBS is also able to record sound from the computer so when I play um, a, an mp3 or a video from YouTube or whatever um, I can even put that into my video but this is not necessary for this one because here in uh, the secret history of the Jesuits I will not play any videos at, at least not I didn't plan that for today so I'm using my old hypercam too <coughs> and uh, of course I have my backup recording running with WavePad Sound Editor and uh, I have prepared a few pic pictures that we can see during this reading because I prepared a little bit of the reading but uh, only two pages or something because I still don't have the time to read the whole book in advance and uh, I know that you will understand that that I don't have the time to do that so I chose to use Hypercam 2 to read the book from the PDF that we see here on page 115, it is opened, and that you can read along with me, and as long as I have prepared pictures to show you, I will show you pictures um, according to the reading, and otherwise, of course, I have opened here my browser on uh, Firefox, and uh, with that <coughs> we can go to picture, shirts, picture search, or whatever, if we need it if, I, it, if it feels appropriate, if it is appropriate during the reading. And for the rest, we rely on the pictures that I prepared for you here. Um, during the reading, The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. Now, without any further ado, let us start. And uh, we will go into Section 5, The Infernal Cycle, Chapter 1, The First World War. Yeah, you see, I said continue reading here on the 5th of September 2017, so that's October, November, December, January, that's four months ago since I produced a video of this. And of course they are still not published, I know that's something else, but for the moment I'm, <coughs> I'm busy with Brad Norman recording the book Cold World Babylon by P.D. Stewart. Also something for you to look out for. Anyway, now really, without any further ado, here we go. In The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris, published in 1975 with The Infernal Cycle, The First World War, Section 5 and Chapter 1 of the book. On page 115 in the PDF, and you know you have a link to download the PDF in the description box of this video, where you can uh, get this book, and of course you can also buy it on the internet if you have the money and you find still a copy on it on Amazon or eBay or whatever. Now, the author continues, To the fury aroused at the Vatican by the Franco-Russian alliance, and shown so well in the Dreyfus affair, which we spoke about extensively in earlier videos, 
to the anger which the Franco-Italian Union incited, and to which the Loubet incident nearly, uh, clearly testified, was added a bitter resentment caused by the Entente Cordiale with England. France had firmly decided not to stand alone opposite her formidable neighbour and Austria-Hungary. Politics so, quote, blind and ill-considered, unquote, according to Monsignor Cristiani, who looked, upon from, uh, who looked upon most unfavorably by the Catholic uh, Holy of Holies, <coughs> well, sorry, <laughs> I butchered that sentence, politics so, quote, unquote, blind and ill-considered, according to Monsignor Cristiani, were looked upon most unfavorably by the Catholic Holy of Holies, meaning the Pope, of course. For, besides jeopardizing the thorough bleeding godless France needed, uh, with godless France, of course, we have to understand here, <laughs> when it says godless France, we have to understand that is from the point of view from the Roman Catholic Church, meaning um, it is uh, godless without the Pope, it is popeless if it's without the God of the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan. Huh? <laughs> So, for besides jeopardizing the thorough bleeding godless France needed, these politics were a priceless support for schismatic Russia. This lost sheep, whose return to the Roman Catholic fold had never ceased to be hoped for, though its accomplishment might mean a war. Yeah, it means a lot more to get the uh, quote-unquote schismatic Russian, meaning the Eastern Orthodox Church back unto the Catholic fold, but since the beginning of the 2000s that is accomplished. And that is uh, quote-unquote thanks to the ecumenical movement, to the ecumenical Second Vatican Council of the 60s. Like so many churches, uh, they came back under the wings of Rome and also the Orthodox did for now. One of the very first wars, even with that we are speaking here, of course, of the First World War, um, uh, though it is accomplished, might mean war. Well, there are more wars, or there were more wars necessary to get the Orthodox Church back onto the wings of Rome. Among others, the war of the 1990s. I mean, the Second World War, of course, we're going to speak about that. Ante Pavelic and Stavelic and the Ustashi. This is all coming up in the Second World War, but also <coughs> the last Balkan War of the 1990s. Yeah? So it took even several wars to accomplish to get the Orthodox Eastern Catholic Church back under the wings of the Western Roman Catholic Church. Now, but for the time being, the Orthodox Church stayed firmly implanted in the Balkans, especially in Serbia, where the Treaty of Bucharest, ending the conflict of the Balkans, had made it a center of attraction for the Slavs of the South, and in particular for those under the yoke of Austria. The ambitious plans of the Vatican and the apostolic imperialism of the Habsburgs were then in perfect accord as in the past. To Rome and Vienna, the growing power of Serbia marked her out as the enemy to overthrow. So, the goal is to get the Orthodox Eastern Catholic Church back under the wings of Rome. And what they realized, not only here, but what the author, what, what the author tells us here is, that to Rome and Vienna the growing power of Serbia marked her out as the enemy to overthrow. So Serbia had to be crushed. Ha! <laughs> and they did that with a lot of actions. Among others, the assassination of the uh, heir to the throne of the Austrian Hungary, Hungary Empire in 1914, which was the trigger for the First World War. Then they did the Ustashi uh, persecutions of the Serb Orthodox during the Second World War. Then you have the NATO attacks in the late 1990s. And now, yeah, it seems that Serbia has finally folded. But let's not go ahead. We read about all this. I just wanted to give you a little heads up. And uh, let's see 
no, this is not the one that I wanted to have here. I want to prepare the pictures that I'm going to show to you in a second. Um, and this is, of course, this one here. So I just have to make sure that these pictures are here and then we can put them in and I will tell you what they show. So this is indeed established in a diplomatic document. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I made a little note, as you can see. This is why this is uh, yellow underlined. Serbia got paid back during World War II and again in the late 1990s. The Orthodox and Christian Serbs are a thorn in the eye of the Antichrist, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Never forget, this is why these books are so important, because they all expose the hierarchy the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church to be the biblical historical and prophetic Antichrist yeah? and everything that is against Antichrist has to be subdued or eliminated extirpated and that is why to Rome and Vienna yeah, the Habsburgs the ruling class of the Roman Empire and Rome, the Antichrist, the growing power of Serbia, marked her out as the enemy to overthrow. The enemy of Antichrist? That is what the Orthodox Church in the eyes of Vienna and Rome is. Now, this is indeed established in a diplomatic document found in the Austrian-Hungarian Hungarian archives. It reports for the benefit of the Austrian minister Bert, uh, Berchtold on the talks Prince Schoenberg had at the Vatican in October and November 1913. So I'm going to show to you picture one that I prepared. And this is the picture here. And this shows to you Prince Otto von Schoenberg Waldenburg. And he is on the left. He is the one that was here at the Vatican in October, November 1913. And he says, quote, Amongst the subjects discussed first of all with the Cardinal Secretary of State, which was Cardinal Mary Delval, last week, the question of Serbia came up as anticipated. First of all, the Cardinal Mary Delval expressed his joy, his joy at our firm and opportune attitude of recent months. During the audience I had that day with His Holiness, the Holy Father, the Antichrist of the Bible, in this case Pope Leo XIII still, in power, who started the conversation by mentioning our energetic steps taken in Belgrade, he, the Antichrist, made some characteristic remarks, quote, it would certainly have been better, said His Holiness, if Austria-Hungary had punished the Serbians for all the wrongs they had done. Unquote. Unquote of the quote of the Antichrist and unquote of the quote of um, Prince Schoenberg, who we see here on the right in the picture. It would certainly have been better if Austria-Hungary had punished the Serbians for all the wrongs they had done. Well, <laughs> I'm going to get a little bit later during the reading into explaining that. The point is that the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, has enemies in this world, but he never addresses his enemies directly. He uses the enemies of the enemies or the friends of the enemies and lets them fight. But as I said, I'm going to go later into that. It is the Pope who instigates all these wars and the Jesuit execute them for them. Hmm? So the warlike sentiments of Pius X were clearly expressed in 1913 already. There is nothing surprising about this when we consider the inspirers of Roman politics. Now, the Habsburgs is the next picture that's coming up. And this is this one here, and it's a book that you can get. What were the Habsburgs supposed to do? The Habsburgs, the reigning bloodline, the reigning family of the Austria-Hungarian 
empire. Uh, it was a empire and a kingdom, uh, the empire of Austria with the kingdom of Hungary together. What were the Habsburgs supposed to do? Chastise Serbia, an orthodox nation. You don't adhere to the politics and the bidding of the Pope, you have to be chastised. The prestige of Austria-Hungary of these Habsburg, uh, Habsburgs, who, with the Bourbons of Spain, were the last supporters of the Jesuits, and especially the prestige of the heir, François Ferdinand, their men would have been greatly increased. For Rome, the affair became one of almost religious importance. A victory of apostolic monarchy over Caesarism could be considered as a victory of Rome over the schism of the East. Unquote. Now, this is, in other words, exactly what I was talking about earlier. For Rome, the affair became one of almost religious importance, a victory of apostolic monarchy, because the Pope considers himself the apostolic successor of Peter, the successor of the Apostles. That's why it is written here, the apostolic monarchy, that is papacy, that is popery, that is the Pope. Over Tsarism could be considered as a victory of Rome over the schism of the East. The schism of the East, the schism which took place in uh, 1054, when the Eastern Orthodox Church split from the Western Roman Catholic Church. But don't make the mistake to say, oh, but the Eastern uh, Catholic, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, they are fine Christians. No, they are not. They are Catholics, as is the Western Roman Catholic Church. They always only have had problems, among others, with the ultramontane uh, leadership of the Pope. That's all. But they are Catholics, as is the Roman Catholic Church itself. Yeah? That's something that you may please always take into account when we read things like this. Of course that doesn't give the Roman Catholic Church, the Western Church, the right to persecute and to kill the Eastern Orthodox. No, they never have the right to do that, of course. That, that's not my point. But don't be entangled in this game when Rome makes out someone as his enemy that you automatically think that those are true Bible-believing Christians, that those are the saints the Bible speaks of. They are not. They are also Catholic, and by that they are also pagan. But they don't adhere to the power of the Pope. They don't follow the ultramontane teaching of the papacy. And that's why here Rome saw the affair of an, I would even scrap the word almost, I would say it is a religious importance, it is a religious war, like all the wars that have been fought in Europe, at least since the, uh, so, uh, res, uh, since the instigation of the Jesuit order, have been religious wars. Therefore, before also, but at least at that time, since the middle of the 16th century, all wars in Europe and even all over the world instigated by the Jesuits are actually religious wars. They are crusades like the wars that we have today in 2017 or 2018 um, and the wars we have had the last years. All wars have a religious background, but of course that background is not told to you because the media are in cahoots with the Antichrist. It says so in Revelation, in uh, chapter 17 and 18, we can read, that the kings of the earth have committed fornication with the whore, the whore, the Roman Catholic Church. The kings have fornicated. Who are the kings of the world these days? The prime ministers, the presidents, and of course kings and whatever people who are ruling a country are the kings of the earth. And they all have committed fornication with the whore. 
they all play along under the horn. And if they don't play along, they are going to feel the hard power of the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic Church has soft power and the Roman Catholic Church has hard power. And when you want to learn more of that, then turn to the reading of Tom Fress of the Global Vatican, where he in 99 readings reads and explains the book of Knight of Malta Francis Rooney, the Global Vatican, and he will tell you about the soft power and the hard power of Rome. I don't have the time nor the nerve to go into that right now, therefore go and visit Tom Fress's reading of the Global Vatican. The playlist will be probably uh, put in the description box of this video and if not you will always find the link to First Amendment Radio's YouTube channel in my description box here and then you go to that channel and you look up the playlist for yourself. I mean do a little bit of your own research. Hmm? Anyway back to the book. Rome says that the affair became one of religious importance. A victory of the popery about Tsarism, meaning the one emperor over the other, would be considered as a victory of Rome over the schism of the East, when the Eastern Orthodox Church split from the Western Catholic Church and made up their own hierarchy. However, the affair dragged on in 1913, but on the 28th of June in 1914, and we're going to see here another picture, this is what happened on the 28th of June in 1914, the Archduke François Ferdinand was murdered at Sarajevo. We just read in the previous paragraph that the prestige of the heir François Ferdinand, their man, the man of the Jesuits, yeah, was murdered in Sarajevo. The Serbian government had nothing very important, nothing to do with the murder, with this crime committed by a Macedonian. I'm going to highlight that in, in color. The Serbian government had nothing to do with this crime committed by a Macedonian student, but it was the perfect excuse for the Emperor François Joseph to start hostilities. Now, let me make sure that you understand me correctly. François Ferdinand was the guy of the Roman Catholic Church to continue the allegiance Rome-Vienna, Antichrist Emperor of Austria-Hungary. And he was killed. So when that line is killed, that, is, that says that there may be no continuation in that working together. And the killing, of course, asks for revenge. <laughs> in our wrong system. Not biblically. There the, lo there the Lord says, revenge is mine. But here on earth, that's another thing. So what do the Jesuits do? They train someone to commit the actual assassination, uh, the assassination of Sarajevo, as you can see here in the picture on the right. And by doing that, they stir up a reason for a war. Uh, the Serbian government had nothing to do with this. No, you have to understand what happened here in 19. 14 on the 28th of June. You can compare to what happened in 1865 with Abraham Lincoln and John Wilkes Booth, who also was just a patsy, who was the patsy of John Surratt, a Jesuit trained assassinator, assassin of then Abraham Lincoln. And here in 1914, exactly the same thing. This poor Macedonian student who had been duped into actually committing the assassination is, except for the deed that he did of course, innocent. It is the Jesuits who planned this and the Jesuits who executed this through him. He is just their patsy. Okay? 
Now the book continues here. Count Sforza maintains that the main problem was to persuade François Joseph that war was necessary. The advice of the Pope and his minister was the one which could best influence him. Unquote. Now, how do we understand what is ri written here? Count Sforza maintains that the main problem was to persuade Francois Joseph that war was necessary. So that means the reigning emperor of Austria-Hungary did not want to go to war. He did not want to go chastise the Serbs as the Pope requires. So to make the emperor do what he actually doesn't want to do is kill his son, kill the heir to his throne. Then he will do the bidding of the Pope, right? Ah, yeah. That's exactly what happened. Yeah? You have to understand that this is how the Jesuits work. And when you continue following the reading of Cold World Babylon, that wonderful book by P.D. Stewart that is uploaded on my channel, you will understand the morals and the constitutions of the Jesuits and the secret instructions and you will understand how they think and what drives them and how they work and that is absolutely necessary for the understanding of this book which we have been talking about also so far but you know even on the danger of repeating myself I think this is so important that here and there a little bit repetition cannot really do any harm you have to understand this, that the Pope in Rome understood that François Joseph, the Emperor, Franz Josef in German we say him, we, we, we call him, needed to be convinced of doing war, because the Pope wanted war, because the Pope wanted the Orthodox nation of Serbia to be chastised, and he wanted the Tsar of Russia to be um, impeached from his throne, but not impeached in a political way, but taken care of. And the Jesuits had many reasons to do that. I don't know if we even go in uh, in this book into that uh, into that interesting fact, how and why uh, the Jesuits had reasons to dethrone the Tsar of Russia. Among others was the reason, of course, that the Tsar of Russia gave support to Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War in the United States of America in the, in the 1860s. Contra to what the Pope wanted, of course. Therefore they had to be punished and the Tsar had to be killed. You know, I, I don't want to go from a hundreds into a thousands little detail, but the point is that we really understand when we read this little um, uh, a quote here from Pierre Dominique in one of his books that Count Sforza maintains that the main problem was to persuade Franz Josef that war was necessary. How better to persuade an emperor that war is necessary by killing the heir to his throne? Right, that's what they did. That's why Prince Ferdinand here was shot in 1914. That started the First World War. This advice, the author continues, was of course given to the Emperor and of the kind which could be expected from his from this Pope and his minister, quote, favorite pupil of the Jesuits, unquote. While Serbia was trying to maintain peace by giving in to all the wishes of the Austrian government which had sent a threatening note to Belgrade, Count Pelfi, Austrian representative to the Vatican, gave to his minister Berchtold on the 29th of July in 1914 a summary of the talks he had had on the 27th with the Cardinal Secretary of State, Marie Delval. This conversation was about, quote, the questions which are disturbing Europe at the moment. <laughs> no, this was not about the questions which are disturbing Europe at the moment. This was about the questions that are disturbing the Antichrist at the moment. What is on the Antichrist agenda, first and for all? That was this all about. No? The diplomat scornfully denies that 
fanciful rumors about the supposed intervention of the Pope, who apparently implored the Emperor to spare the Christian nations the horrors of war. <laughs> okay, we have to read this again, the, me the way that the sentence is meant. The diplomat scornfully denies the fanciful rumors about the supposed intervention of the Pope, who apparently implored the Emperor to spare the Catholic nations the horrors of war. Having dealt with these absurd suppositions, he expounds the real opinion of the Curia as conveyed to him by the Secretary of State, Mary Delval. The real opinion of the Curia, this is the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. And when they speak here about Christian nations who, have spared, who want to be spared the wars, no, those are not Christians, these are Catholic nations. Because real Christian, real Protestant nations are to be extirpated from the face of the earth. That's the goal of the Jesuits. That's the reason for their whole existence. Yeah? The real opinion of the Curia as conveyed by the Secretary of State Mary Delval is as follows. Quote, it would have been impossible to detect any spirit of indulgence and conciliation in the words of His Eminence, meaning the Pope. It is true that he described the note to Serbia as very harsh, but he nevertheless approved of it entirely and, at the same time and indirectly, expressed the wish that the monarchy would finish the job. Indeed, added the Cardinal, it was a pity that Serbia had not been humiliated much earlier, as it could have been done, then without such great risks attached. This declaration echoes the wishes of the Pope who, over the past few years, often expressed regret that Austria-Hungary had neglected chastising her dangerous neighbor on the Danube. Unquote. The Danube is the river that is running there through Serbia. Okay. Now, as we go along, we have to understand that everything that I just read to you is nothing else but the politics of the Pope all along. War, war, war. Because the Roman Catholic Church does not prosper in times of peace, the Church only prospers in times of war. Yeah? The Church at war moves the agenda of the Antichrist forward. The Church in peace does move the agenda of the Antichrist whether backwards or keeps it stable standing in place. And without any progress, Satan cannot reach his, duel, his, his goal. Because you have to understand that we are in a spiritual battle. That's it all about. This spiritual uh, battle is fought with carnal weapons and carnal wars. Because spiritual, most people don't even understand. So they are shown by the actions in this world, by the wars and wars and rumors of wars everywhere, and still they don't understand that the underlying reason actually is only spiritual. Every war is a religious war, is a crusade of the devil against his enemies. Yeah? Now, continue reading here. This indeed, and there's a reason why I highlighted this text, this indeed is just the opposite to the fanciful rumors about a pontifical intervention in favor of peace. Now in fact the Austrian diplomat is not the only one who reports to the real opinion of the Roman pontiff and his minister. <laughs> what is the real opinion of the Roman pontiff? Well, you have the esoteric and the exoteric, teaching and knowledge. And of course also you have the open and you have the hidden policy of the Vatican, the politics of the Vatican. Yes, the Vatican is a political power, the Vatican is a state, the Vatican is a country, is a kingdom, an absolute monarchy. 
It is the little horn that comes out of the ten horns, and on its head is the son of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist of the Bible. We have to understand that without that understanding, even reading or following this book doesn't help you anyway. You need to understand that the papacy is the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. There is no future Antichrist, there is no rapture, there is no seven-year tribulation, except for that that they're going to play on you, because they do a replay of the 70th week of Daniel, which Jesus Christ fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And I went into that extensively, and everything that Tom Fress and Inquisition Update teaches is about that subject. Avail yourself of that information if you don't understand it. The papacy is the Antichrist and everything we read here only comes to full fruition and understanding when you understand that the papacy is the Antichrist. When you don't understand that, when you don't believe that because you don't study the Bible, which explicitly in numerous places warns us about the papacy being the Antichrist, then you don't understand this book. Then it is even not necessary that you waste your time watching this. Go elsewhere, where they preach the love gospel, the money gospel, where they preach the love of Jesus. Well, Jesus loves, I preach that too, but I also preach that Jesus told us about the coming Antichrist. He warned all his people to get out of Dutch or Jerusalem before 70 AD because he knew that the prince that would come, the people of the prince that would come, would destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD, as Daniel predicted. Yeah? So Jesus Christ wanted about the Antichrist. Jesus Christ knew what was coming, first of all because he is God and he knows everything, but second of all because Rome was reigning in the time of Jesus Christ, as Rome is reigning right now. There is no fifth empire. There are four. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. Rome pagan and Rome papal. But Rome, still it is. The Vatican is a political institution, it is a state, it is a power. And therefore it is engaged in politics. Go to Tom Fress, Inquisition Update, the Global Vatican. Let's see if I can get the picture here right fast, that I can show it to you. When I'm speaking about it all the time, then yeah, why not have a look? You know, Tom Fress was reading this book from Francis Rooney, a Knight of Malta, the ambassador to the from the United Nations to the Vatican between 2005 and 2008 on Inquisition Update. And that reading can, if you follow it, really open your eyes to understand the political agenda of the Vatican. The Vatican is the beast. And the Roman Catholic Church is the woman that rides the beast. Revelation 17. Jesus Christ told us beforehand. Now we have history to look back on and understand it. And Tom Fress, with his reading of the Global Vatican, leaves absolutely no doubt of the political agenda of the Vatican. Of that country. And of course, in combination with that church. That's why the book is called the Global Vatican. That is what you guys call the New World Order. I call it the Old World Order Restored. What is the Old World Order Restored? Well, that is the time before the Reformation, when the Pope, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, was the supreme ruler via the Vatican, over all the kings of the known world in that time, of that part of the world that was important. Okay, he was not the ruler of China completely, he was not the China he was not the ruler of Japan, he was not the ruler of India. That's not important. Important was the world that was controllable at that time. America wasn't even found yet. And when they discovered America, well, the Jesuits directly went in there and infiltrated that country from the beginning. From the beginning of the 15th century until the founding of the United States in 1776. The government of the United States of America was Jesuitically 
infiltrated from the start. And Tom Fress makes that point, among others, very well in the Global Vatican. Avail yourselves to that reading. I can only advise you. Now, let's see, where did we start here? Uh, where did we stop here? <laughs> In fact, the Austrian diplomat is not the only one who reports on the real opinion of the Roman pontiff and his ministers. Yeah? We have the real opinion, we have the secret opinion, huh? the secret teaching of the Vatican, and we have the open teaching of the Vatican. And we are speaking here, the real opinion, that is the hidden agenda of the Pope, of the Roman pontiff and his minister, uh, Marie Del, Del Val. <sighs> In fact, the Austrian diplomat is not the only one who reports the real opinion. The day before, on the 26th of July, Baron Ritter, Bavarian charged affair to the Vatican, today we call that an, amb uh, an ambassador, um, had written to his government in Bavaria. Yeah? The German state in the south of Germany, who has never been infected with the... <laughs> infected with the... Uh, uh, with the with the Reformation, who has always been arch-Catholic, and he says, quote, the Pope agrees with Austria dealing severely with Serbia. The Pope agrees with Austria dealing severely with Serbia. He doesn't think much of the Russian, and he doesn't think much of the French armies, and is of the opinion that they the Russian and the French armies could not do very much in a war against Germany. The Cardinal Secretary of State doesn't see when Austria could make war if she does not decide now. The Cardinal Secretary, Marie Del Val of State, doesn't see when Austria could make war if she does not decide now. It's now or never! That's what they say. That's what the hidden agenda of the Pope is, and that is what this ambassador, this charged affair, actually gives on information back to Germany, into Bavaria. The Holy Father and his Jesuit counselors were not concerned about the sufferings of quote-unquote Christian nations. <laughs> no, of course not, because Real Christian nations are the nations of Bible-believing Christians, Protestant, and the Roman Catholic Church is there to extirpate them. And they are not concerned about quote-unquote Christian nations when on these Christian nations there are liberal Catholics on there, like you guys in the United States of America today. Your Catholics are liberals in the eyes of the ultramontane holding to the Council of Trent very, very, very right, very, very, very extreme Roman Catholic Church, cardinals, bishops and all that stuff. All the liberals have to go. They are also viewed as quote-unquote Christian nations. They don't care about that. The Jesuits even offer up themselves, if it is for the Church in the end, to gain. It was not the first time that these nations were, s were used for the benefit of Roman politics. The opportunity wished for had come at last to use the Germanic secular arm against Orthodox Russia, so to fight a civil power, to fight a spiritual power. Huh? To fight the Germanic secular arm, that means the German army, which is represented by the German civil power, the German civil power to fight against orthodox spiritual Russia. Also against quote-unquote godless France, because it is godless, because it shook up the power of the Jesuits at that time, and it was not a real Roman Catholic. They were Gallicans, they were liberals, which needed, this France needed a quote-unquote thorough bleeding and, as a bonus, against quote-unquote heretic England. Everything seemed to promise a lively and happy war. 
I made a little comment here that I'm going to read to you right now. The subtle Roman Catholic Church has assumed the position of the lad who holds two of his enemies. You and he fight. I'll hold the coats. We have an enemy, and I believe we should be verbal and active against that enemy, but I feel it is time that we realize that our enemy is not our brother. It is the one holding his coat. Now, where does that all of a sudden come from? I tell you. Let's read this last sentence again. The opportunity wished for a godless France, which needed a thorough bleeding and as a bonus against heretic... Uh, sorry. The opportunity wished for had come at last to use the Germanic secular arm against Orthodox Russia, to be used the German secular arm against godless France, which needed a thorough bleeding, and as a bonus against heretic England. Everything seemed to promise a lively and happy war. Now, why am I reading this again? Because now you will understand the comment that I made here. The comment reads... The subtle Roman Catholic Church has assumed the position of the lad who holds two of his enemies, uh, the, who, who holds the coats of two of his enemies, and says, you and he fight, I'll hold the coats. The point being, they use the Germanic secular arm against Russia, uh, against Orthodox Russia, they use the German secular arm against godless French, with, which needed a thorough bleeding as a punishment for what they did in the 19th century against the Jesuits and of course as a bonus against heretic England because England at that time was still protestant. Everything seemed to promise a lively and happy war. So the Pope stirs up the Germanic secular arm against Orthodox Russia, Godless France and heretic England. He lets these three fights where in the meantime he holds the coat. Meaning, he instigates the wars that these people fight against each other and in the end he will come there as the quote-unquote man of peace. He will suggest the peace under his terms. You have heard of thesis, antithesis and synthesis, right? This is exactly it. Stirring up your enemies against each other instead of against you because they don't know that you are the enemy because they don't know anymore that the papacy is the antichrist that knowledge wasn't there in the politics a hundred years ago it wasn't there 150 years ago especially not in all the countries of europe the teaching the futurist teaching of the antichrist took away that pillar or undermined that pillar of the Reformation. Uh, the most important pillar of the Reformation is that the papacy is the Antichrist. And here the Antichrist takes his quote-unquote enemies, stirs them up against each other, and is the winner in the end. They use the Germanic secular arm, the German army, the German civil power, against spiritual Orthodox Russia, against godless France and against Protestant England. Pius X did not see its unfolding and result because he died before, both contrary to his forecasts. He died at the beginning of the conflict on the 20th of August in 1914. So that's Pius X, so I was mistaken when I earlier spoke about Leo XIII. We had Leo XIII after... Pope Pius the Ninth, then we had Pope Pius the Tenth, and then of course we had Pope Pius the Eleventh um, as the successor. But forty years later, Pius the Twelfth, Hitler's Pope, who we are going to learn a lot about in the future readings of this book, Pius the Twelfth, Antichrist Pius the Twelfth, canonized this August Pontiff and the quote Précis d'Histoire Sainte or the summary of holy history used for parochial catechism dedicated to him these edifying words to Pope Pius X. Quote, Pius X did 
all he could to prevent the start of the 1914 war, and he died of anguish when he foresaw the sufferings it would unleash. Unquote. It was a satire. If it was a satire, it could not be put in a better way. Applause, applause, applause. That's exactly it. And how I understand this and how I try to make you to understand what I read, I hope that you get the satire and that sentence of Pope Pius XII about Pope Pius X also. Again, Pius X, which says Pope Pius XII when he canonized Pope Pius X, did all he could to prevent the start of the 1914 war and he did of he died of anguish when he foresaw the sufferings it would unleash. Unquote. If it was satire, it could not be put in a better way. That is satire. That is how they uh, how they sell, uh, how they sell this. Uh, how they how they also say this. Um, yeah, comedy is, is is not the right word. I'm looking for another word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's on the tip of my tongue. I can't come to you and I don't want to pause now the recording to, to look this up. But, you know, this is really absolutely in your face. Absolutely in your face. We've learned that the Pope pushed the Emperor for a war because he wanted Serbia to be punished. He wanted the uh, Russian Orthodox Church to forget about the schism of 1055 and come back under the wings of Rome. He wanted to punish all these. He used the Germans to fight against the Russian Orthodox Church. He used the Germans to fight against quote-unquote godless France. He used the German secular arm to fight against Protestant England. And everything or the most part of Germany above Bavaria was Protestant at that time. We are speaking about the Protestant Second Reich between uh, 1871 and 1918, the end of the First World War. So, let's. Uh, why do the Germans who are Protestants even fight against quote-unquote heretic England from the point of view of the Pope, meaning Protestant England, why do two Protestant countries fight against each other? There is no reason and especially not if you are real Protestant, and when you understand the Bible. Because the Bible says, don't kill. Thou shalt not kill. Also in war. War is not biblical. Now, don't get me wrong, there were wars in the Old Testament, in, in the times of the law and the prophet, that were legitimate because God led them. But that is a complete, complete other subject. Wars between people, wars between men, are always against the commandments of God. Thou shalt not kill. And this is really satirical, the way that it is written here. That is really the satire that Pope Pius XII used in the canonization of Pope Pius X to say that he died of anguish when he foresaw the sufferings it would unleash, I would say he probably died of happiness when he unleashed that. Okay, there we're going to have another picture I have prepared here, so let's go and have a look at this. This is Mr. Yves Guyot. Because a few years before 1914, the author continues, Yves Guyot, who you see in this picture here on the left right now, or on the right right now, a true prophet, <laughs> well, okay, not, not a biblical prophet, okay? Let's not hammer on that, but he's not a real biblical prophet. Anyway, Mr. Yves Guyot, a few years before 1914, said, quote, if war breaks out, listen, you men who think that the Roman Church is the symbol of order and peace, and do not search for blame outside of the Vatican. It, the Vatican, will be the sly instigator, as in the War of 1870. Unquote. Instigator of the slaughter. 
the Vatican was going to uphold no less craftily her Austro-German champions right through the war. The military excursion in France, which the Kaiser boasted he was going to make, was stopped at the Marne River, and the aggressor brought back to the defensive after every one of his furious attacks. But at least pontifical diplomacy brought him all the help possible, and this is not surprising when we consider that divine providence seemed to delight in favoring the central empires. Now for our next picture we turn to Cardinal Rampolla. Indeed Cardinal Rampolla considered to be pro-French and for that reason kept away from the pontifical throne on a veto from Austria, wasn't any more amongst those who could become Pope as he had died a few months before Pius X, a death, it seems, very opportune. Now, let me tell you, when someone of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, someone of the Curia, a cardinal, dies at a quote-unquote very opportune moment, it had been helped by the Jesuits, okay? who are the masters of poisoning, who are the masters of assassination. We have to have to understand that. The author continues, but this was not the whole of God's intervention. As he had promised, even before voting took place, the new Pope, Benedict XV, appointed Cardinal Ferrata, a secretary of state. But the Cardinal did not even have the time to take up fully his new position. Having entered the secretary's office at the end of September 1914, he died suddenly on the 20th of October, victim of a terrible indisposition after partaking of some light refreshments. <laughs> light refreshments? Quote, he was sitting at his desk when he suddenly became violently sick. He fell as if lightning had struck him. The servants hastened to come to his help. The doctor who had been called immediately realized straight away the gravity of the situation and asked for a quick consultation. As for Ferrata, he had already understood and knew there was no hope. He pleaded that he should not be left to die at the Vatican. The medical consultation took place immediately at his hotel with six doctors. They refused to draw up a medical bulletin. The one published bore no signatures. He was not suffering from any kind of sickness or infirmity. Quote, the scandal of his death was such that an inquest could not be avoided. The result of it was a jar had been broken in the office. The presence of pounded glass in the sugar bowl used by the cardinal was explained quite simply in that way. Granulated sugar can be useful. The inquest, the inquest was stopped there. Why? Granulated sugar can be useful. And to granulated sugar that the cardinal used to sweeten his coffee or tea or whatever, there was probably arsenic or another kind of poison in there that was used by the Jesuits to get rid of that person. Now, um, I think that this is quite an interesting moment to stop the reading here with the assassination of the cardinal, yeah, Ferrata, uh, Rampolla, considered to be pro-French. Yeah, when you're pro-French, then you are against the papacy, then you are against the Vatican, then you are against the Pope, the Antichrist, and when you are against the Antichrist, you will be taken care of. Let me assure you that. Yeah? We've come to almost an hour of the reading after a long break, but anyway, that doesn't matter for you because you can find all the readings of this wonderful book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, in the playlist, The Secret History of the Jesuits. 
and there you will have the continuation and after this I will do the next reading quite fast and try to see to upload within the first uh, uh, starting at least within the first three months of 2018 this book to YouTube but this is of course futile to tell you in this part okay I thank you very much for watching and listening and commenting. If you have any interesting comments, and still I want to uh, remind you to uh, please go to Tom Fress's reading of the Global Vatican. Uh, you can find this in um, uh, First Amendment Radio, his YouTube channel and uh, a link to his channel and where you can find the playlist is provided in the description box of this video okay so then here it says for me on Jogla 66 to say goodbye thanks for watching thanks for listening thanks for commenting always do your own research and until next time with another part of the secret history of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris Jörg from Jogla 66 Hour of the Truth says God bless you and bye bye. A specialized work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, uh, as her own purpose is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines. Uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession and that is dealing with the papacy and the other is the doctrine the temporal power and that is dealing with world government. Of course both because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope. He said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.